Hi, Misha here, and one of the videos that we did over six years ago that still gets views, even as of a couple of weeks back, is the Sturmgewehr 44, SGG 44, versus AK-47, or AK Type 3. Basically, in that video a long time ago, we looked at, did Hugo Schmeiser really develop the AK with Mikhail Kalashnikov taking credit? Or did he work on it and just not get credited and influence it? The easy conclusion in that video was no. But that video is quite old now and is an hour and a half long. I wanted to try to be more concise and explain the points and why I've concluded for quite some time that Schmeisser had very little practical and actual influence on the AK. However, there may be one or two things. We'll get into it. But overall, not really. In this video, I want to bring out the receipts and show you why. I ask you just to approach this with an open mind, no preconceptions, and also understand that historical research is always an ongoing process and is never fully finished. So with that, we'll compare an original MP44, STG44, and my Russian early AK Type 3 kit build on a US receiver, and really get into this from several angles. And as always, if you could, Please like, share, and subscribe. If you'd like to help support us, check out Patreon. And if you'd like a more in-depth video, you can always check out the original. It is still up and still viewable on the YouTubes. With that, let's just dive in. First off, let's get the cartridge, the caliber, out of the way. Of course, the Kalashnikov was chambered for 762 by 39 and the MP44, 7.92 by 33s, 8mm curves. Now, this is not really even relevant to the video because no one has ever claimed that Mikhail Kalashnikov developed this cartridge. In fact, he explicitly did not. Russia developed this cartridge, kind of laying down the specifications. Initially, it was actually called 762 by 41 in November of 1943 and started making test batches to send out the designers. Yes, in 1944, Kalashnikov, along with several others, did get their hands on some Russian made ammo. And yes, it was overtly based on the intermediate cartridge that the uh, Germans were using. But here's the thing. The idea really wasn't created in Germany, at least not out of whole cloth either. The Germans themselves were very much inspired by and interested in the US Winchester M1 carbine. Now this fires 30 caliber carbine, 7.62 by 33. Notice the similarity in length there. Of course, the German round is in their standard 8mm caliber, and the American, and the Russian for that matter, in their standard 30 caliber, 7.62. Now, full disclosure, of course, the M1 carbine has a mostly straight wall cartridge. There is a tiny bit of taper, and it is a round nose bullet. So technically, it's, it's, it's a pistol round, more than it's a rifle or even intermediate round. However, the concept is kind of there, at least nascent. So what the Germans did, they looked at the compact round and decided, hey, that's not a bad idea. It saves on weight, it saves on recoil. Let's just make it our standard 8mm, 8x57 round, but let's cut it down to the 33 length and we have a nice intermediate cartridge. So in a lot of ways, they were the first to really field it but its inspiration can definitely be said to go back to the good old M1 carbine. Heck, even the notion of a higher capacity detaching magazine can be credited towards it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I just wanted to get the caliber out of the way because it's not really relevant when you're talking Schmeiser and Kalashnikov. What is relevant, though, 
at least directly, is what the individuals themselves said. Of course, both are no longer with us. Kalashnikov passed away quite recently. Schmeiser actually passed away in 1953, so quite long ago. But what did they say? Well, this is a good place to start when you come to historical research. Kalashnikov maintained for quite some time, even after the fall of the Soviet Union, that there was no direct influence and that Schmeiser did not directly work on his design. Later in life, he sometimes attributed inspiration to the MP44, which is honestly, how could you not? Certainly the class of weapon, the, the style weapon is there. But direct influence. Did Schmeisser work on it? Did he create it? Or did Kalashnikov go to him for help? He says no. There are arguments to be made, and we'll get into that, but that's what he says. What did Schmeiser say? Well, not much, but he was asked if he helped the Russians, and he basically said no. He gave a few suggestions in general, not necessarily with the Kalashnikov, just in general, but he refuted any notions that he helped design the AK-47. Again, there are reasons why he might have not been telling the truth or might have even been lying, but at the same time, we have these direct first-hand statements from individuals, there's no reason to immediately jump to the conclusion they were lying. They could have been, but there isn't. Moreover, other evidence actually supports the fact that they were probably telling mostly the truth. Why do I say that? Well, to be honest, Schmeiser's design elements really don't appear in the Kalashnikov, believe it or not. And the timelines really don't line up. Not not much. There was only a brief period that Smicer really could have influenced the design. And prototypes and photos of them that survive to this day don't seem to indicate that. Hugo Schmeiser really put his name on the map with the original MP18 and the much improved MP28. He was focused on submachine guns. He worked on a few other guns, including some efforts with the MG34 and 42, and he had a partnership with Hanel or Hanel, and this would directly lead to the Stungewehr here. Now I'm not going to go in this gun's history in this video we've covered in the past. I want to keep this as succinct as possible. But he was the lead designer, but only the lead designer on a team. And the original prototype was known as the MKB-42H, H for Hanel. And its main competitor was the MKB-42W, W for Walter. Now the H, originally, was an open bolt striker fire design. Both were chambered for the new 8mm Kurs round. The Walther was a closed bolt hammer fire design. After field trials, the H was selected. However, the MKB-42 would give way to the MKB-43 and MP-43 pre-production model. And while these would carry many of the elements from the original 42H over, they would actually borrow the closed bolt design and the hammer system from the Walther. So, Schmeiser, Hanel, did not actually design the firing system initially. That actually came from Walther. But of course much else, including the magazine and all that, would come from Hanel. And of course the, from the 43, it would be changed to the MP44 with some improvements in early 1944. And then later in the year, the name would be changed to Stumgewehr, STG44, when they really kind of figured out what this was supposed to be. Obviously the MP was from machine pistol originally because no one really understood what an assault rifle or a storm rifle was really up to. It was new, just as the submachine gun was a new thing in uh, World War II. I'm mentioning this because Schmeiser's con uh, design commitments here had to do with some of the gas system, the magazine, and the recoil assembly, but not so much the fire control group. Also, the stamped receiver system. And, and all that that we see here. 
What about after the war? Immediately after the war, the Allies, namely the US and British, but sometimes the French too, would interview Schmeiser and other German engineers. For whatever reason, they were not interested in the new storm rifle. Therefore, the Soviets got a hold of Schmeiser in July of that year, and they were interested. After all, many of the MP44s were sent to the Eastern Front, so they had more first-hand experience against these. Only about 425,000 were made in the war. Not bad, considering how late it was introduced, but, yeah, they had a lot of respect for it. In fact, they were already kind of planning for their own. As I said, they made their own cartridge derivation. So they would interview him. That summer, they would also assemble around 50 MP44s from parts they had taken after the war, and they had well over a thousand documents and blueprints and tools and all that good stuff. And then in October of 1944, they invited Schmeiser to come work for them in Russia. I'm sure it was completely consensual. Therefore, in the summer of 1946, he was relocated to the city of Ishesk and put to work as a designer and really just consultant at Factory 74. And yes, the Kalashnikov was originally mass produced at Ishesk. So this actually looks like it supports the argument that Schmeiser was there and worked on it. However, that's only half of the story. Some like to present Mikhail Kalashnikov as an ignorant peasant tractor mechanic. Do I have to even state how stupid that is? After all, how much formal education did John Moses Browning have? Or Kajiro Nambu? They definitely had some, but even Schmeiser did a lot of learning on the job and from his father. This is the era. And yes, he started off working with tractors in the 1930s. He also worked in a rail yard. But he joined the military in 1938, and already by 1939, he was making a name for himself in tanks. He had two or three patents to his name for developing things for tanks. So he was already getting noticed. Of course, he would fight after Operation Barbarossa, and he would be wounded in September of 1941, and that would lead him into nearly half a year stay in hospital. While there, he read. If you've ever been bedridden, you know exactly what it's like. You read all you can. Also, they don't call it the Great Patriotic War in Russia for nothing. It really was all about survival, patriotism. He talked with wounded soldiers, and he himself had served for several months as a sergeant and tank commander. So between his own experience and those he spoke with, he decided that a new firearm was needed for the Red Army, something that could be produced quickly, easily, used simply, durable, dependable, lightweight, yada, yada, yada. And he read many books, and he came up with an idea for a submachine gun. And it just so happens in 1942, he got out of the hospital around February, trials were about to begin for a new simplistic, light submachine gun to supplement the already quite successful Papa Shaw, PPSH-41. Well, as it happens, his first firearm design failed. Rather, Sudiev would win with his PPS first 42, later 43 here. A very simple gun firing 760 by 25 Tokarev, built with most all the stamped steel construction receivers and a folding stock, all that good stuff. But this was his foot in the door. His design, somewhat unique for a submachine gun, was closed bolt striker fired. But it just, it just wasn't ready. But he would regroup, and in 1943, some in the general staff would take notice of this uh, up-and-comer. Again, already he had made a name for himself in tanks, now had submitted a submachine gun design, and so it was decided to send him 
to the Proving Grounds at Insk and have him work on some guns, including the SG-43 Gorionov. He would even work for a brief time under Sudiev. And just kind of get him a working education. Not that he was terribly ignorant, but most of what he learned up to this point was via books. We're going to come back to that, though. There's one book in particular worth mentioning. But in 1943, he got a lot of hands-on experience and ultimately would end up meeting Dikterev and Simonov and Sudiev, like I said, as well as other up-and-coming designers. Thus, in 1944, when test rounds of 762 by 41 went out, Kalashnikov, who had some good patrons at the top of the general staff, received some, and worked on his own prototype. Kalashnikov's submission would fire from a rotating closed bolt, short stroke gas piston, and it would go up against a few other designs, including one from Sudiev, the AS-44, and Simonov would also put in a design. Now this was not for the self-loading carbine. This was for the select fire assault rifle, even though they didn't really have that terminology quite yet in Russia. And ultimately, no one was selected. Although the AS-44 was put into limited production, but then Sudiev would pass away, and so that design kind of met its end. And the Simonov design was also not selected. The, the Kalashnikov design was not selected. Again, nothing really was. Instead, they went a little more conservative with the end of World War II, just adopting the self-loading carbine as the SKS-45, and for that matter, a light machine gun from Dityev as the RPD. So let's move forward past the end of the war, past 1945. What happens? Trials resume in 1946 for this select fire gun. And Kalashnikov, having learned some lessons, submits his AK-46 as it's been known. This was selected in late spring, early summer of that year, and its main competitors were the AD and the AB-46. And they would use, in trials later that year, the existing AS-44s as kind of a control gun, since they didn't have anything else in 760 by 49, at 41. So yeah, going with that. This gun, the AK-46, is quite different from this gun. The AK we know and love today has a long stroke gas piston with this rather exposed high up gas tube. But the 46 prototypes actually had a short stroke gas piston with a rather low mounted tube, very much like we see in the SKS. And just a, with the SKS, the short stroke piston was not directly connected to the carrier, it actually would tap it. So you might say that he copied Simonov here. But even then, you can go back further, because the Russian SVT-40 also had a short stroke gas piston system. Of course, this was an improved version of the SVT-38, which was the competitor that went up against and originally lost to the AVS-36, which was another semi-off design. I'm mentioning this to show you how you can trace these designs back. Now, are they modified each time? Are they identical? No. They're improved. Or simplified each time but short stroke piston other things for the 46 it had a removable trigger group kind of a separate group not unlike the SKS it's not the same but yeah it also had a non reciprocating charging handle the safety and fire mode selector were two independent switches and it used a different style of top cover recoil spring it's a different setup it really truly is and Kalashnikov offered it a Model 1 with a milled receiver or a Model 2 with a stamped receiver, somewhat like his original submachine gun or the PPS-43 or even the PPSH-41. Stamping was not unknown to Russia in World War II. Were they the masters of it? No. But they certainly made about 8 million submachine guns that used stampings. So I wanted to mention that. Now, I also want to talk about how we got to the AK-47 and how Kalashnikov handled his 
borrowing of ideas. I've seen some claim that uh, all the Soviets could do was copy and they didn't have a lot of innovation in small arms. They also forget that the 1916 Fedorov was quite possibly the world's first sort of kind of assault rifle, certainly select fire battle rifle. And I mention it because it's actually the, uh, the book Evolution of Small Arms Development published by Fedorov that Kalashnikov himself greatly attributes. He read it cover to cover more than once during his stay in the hospital. And he credits, create, uh, excuse me, credits other books from the hospital's library. He pretty much read everything he could. And I mention this because it shows an attitude. I'm sure Mikhail Kalashnikov had an ego. I'm sure he was proud of his gun. In fact, he is. But from the get-go, he is not shy about sharing his inspirations and crediting others who helped him along the way, including his fellow soldiers. He gives a lot of the idea for the simplicity and durability for his weapon to just talking with all these soldiers in the hospital and beyond. And so, yes, he credited, excuse me, credited Fedorov's book. What about Simonov? Like I said, he definitely took something from him and worked with him and met him. Well, he claims that Simonov treated him, Kalashnikov, like a little brother. That he was a friend, a mentor, and says he was very helpful and very inspirational. Uh, so he, he gave credit there. He also attributes the Sudiev AS-44 design for kind of the notion of loose tolerances to reduce friction and, and wear points and, and give lots of area for grime and grit to get in there. So that came from the AS-44. And he also wasn't at all afraid to copy from uh, his competitors. So let's talk about how the AK-46 became the AK-47. Honestly, it came about thanks to the switch from 7.62x41 to the improved 7.62x39 cartridge specifications. In December of 1946, the AK-46 was tested along with the AB-46 and the AD designs, and none of them really passed, but especially the AK. It, it wasn't accurate enough, it had some issues, but since they were going to a new cartridge design in 1947, the, uh, the Trials Bureau allowed the designers to work with the new cartridge and refine their gun to work for it. Now basically it was just supposed to be a straightforward rechambering. That was the idea. Mikhail Kalachnikov, though, took the chance to rework his design rather extreme. And he would fully admit that this was part of a team even crediting by name several other lead designers, and they were actually based out of the Kafarov factory, number two, not Izhesk. That's where we can talk about the time period again and Schmeiser. Yes, in 1946 and 1947, Schmeiser is at Izhesk. The problem is Kalashnikov nor his gun were there. They were at a totally different factory, quite a long ways off. And this is where the, the basic design comes from. Now, as famously known, the original design here would be the stamped receiver. Like I said, the 46, well, there was a milled version because milling was very common in the era of the SKS. But with the 47, they were really going to go try pushing the new stampings. This was to save on weight and hopefully speed up production. So, what happened? First, Kalashnikov reworked the gas system, going from the low-mounted gas tube to the high-mounted with a switch from a short stroke to a long stroke. He also went to a new style of removable top cover and a new style of re, re, uh, captive recoil spring. Most of this he directly copied or was very much inspired by his competitor, the AB-46. Flipping it over, for simplicity and de uh, dependability, the non-reciprocating charging handle was removed and a fixed handle put on the carrier. And as I said, the 46 had separate fire mode selectors and safeties. With the 47, it became one unit with three positions. 
which also acted as a dust cover, port cover. Neat idea. Totally didn't come from Kalashnikov. And he admitted it, very much so. He said in interviews and in letters, this safety selector was inspired by the Model 8, which was created by John Moses Browning. And if you look at a Model 8, which I'm sorry I don't have one to show you, it looks so similar. In fact, Kalashnikov was quite generous at saying that John Moses Browning was inspirational as a, as a rule for his guns. Uh, then again, who couldn't find the Browning story admirable with all the books he read in the library? I'm sure it would make anyone a fan. And in fact, he goes beyond that, crediting another famous American, a rather Canadian designer, John Grand, specifically the M1 Grand. Now, at first, you might not see a similarity. However, these both have two lug rotating bolts. They're housed differently. This is a circle, round. This is more of a rectangular shape, but they're actually similar. And this has an op rod and all that, not unlike. There was definitely some M1 Grand DNA in the AK. 46 and AK-47, and yet again, Kalashnikov was happy to admit inspiration. But here's the thing, John Grant himself had his own inspiration that he credited. The world's first mass production self-loading military rifle that actually saw service, the French RSC M1917, and of course its later 1918 improved version. Yeah, they made uh, over 85,000 of these, and they saw service in World War I, and really the trigger group is very similar to what's in the Grand, and even the kind of offset to the side op rod system is there, and the seat does use even a rotating bolt. So Grand credited the RSC, and Kalashnikov credited the Grand, meaning the bolt system and even somewhat of the fire control group has French DNA. In December of 1947, the new updated Kalashnikov design goes into field trials, and these last through early 1948. And this time it's declared the winner. Even most of its rivals admit that while it's the least accurate, frankly, that it is uh, the most durable, the most reliable, and has the most potential for wide-scale mass production using Russian technology. Again, the original type would have had a thick stamped receiver. And so, in the spring of 1948, Kalashnikov's design was transferred to Izhesk, Factory 74, where Hugo has been just kind of there hanging out. So, he would, at the earliest, be exposed to the design mid-1948. The reason they transferred it to Izhesk was they wanted to do a limited production run to give to troops for field trials and make any other last minute improvements. But here's the thing, Mikhail Kalashnikov did not go with it, not at first. He remained behind and he wanted to develop a version that could address some of the accuracy concerns and a few others. And he would actually make a prototype known as the AK-48. However, the uh, Red Army decided not to go with it. They thought the 47 was good enough and so the AK-48 was shelved. Finally, in the summer of 1949, Mikhail Kalashnikov also moves to the city of Izhesk and starts working at Factory 74, actually a position he would maintain for the rest of his working life. So finally, in the summer of 49, both individuals are working at the same factory. The thing is, by this point, the AK Type 1, as we know it, was pretty well standardized. But then, of course, the issues with the stamped receivers come up. And as we know today, by 1951, they would revert to a machined receiver, a milled receiver. Now, this was not because the stamped receivers were coming apart, blowing up in soldiers' hands. No, it's because 
the rejection rate for receivers when at the factory being made was higher than was acceptable. If they actually got a receiver to come out and be bent and go into shape properly, it worked. The problem is it was just not working well enough to offset costs. Machining, while it was more time consuming and resource consuming, it was okay. This was peacetime. Labor was essentially free for the Russians and they had plenty of steel. So the need for a stamped receiver was just not that felt in 1949-1950. So we get the switch to the AK Type 2 and then they further kind of simplified and improved AK Type 3 as early as 1953. Some sources say it's 54. In between Type 1 and Type 2 and Type 2 and Type 3 there were transitional guns regardless. So what about Schmeiser? Where's the room for him? So the bolt system is credited to Grand and the gas piston can go to Grand too. Honestly, many others. Long stroke is not new. The safety selector is a Browning system. Many of the other things can be traced back to other Russian prototypes, the AS-44, AB-46. The cartridge really doesn't matter because um, that's not anything that Kalashnikov himself designed at all. So where's the room for Schmeiser? There's only a few areas we can really talk about. The stamped receiver. Germany was definitely ahead of Russia when it came to precise stampings. No question about it. Could Smizer have contributed, given advice, worked on the stamping process? It is yes. Yes. But, like I said, the design wasn't even transferred there until 1948. And by 1951, they had abandoned stamped receiver AKs going to MILD. They would not return to the stamped receiver concept until 1959. So if he helped with the stampings, he wasn't successful. His advice didn't work or wasn't useful. And this is actually backed up by reports from his handlers, his supervisors in Russia. They credited him with being a very competent engineer, but said that he frankly just wasn't that helpful, wasn't very cooperative, didn't really do much. And I, I believe it. Why would he? For one thing, he's a, quite an old man at this point, you know, getting, uh, getting into his 60s. He's a German following World War II. He's forcibly removed from it. Why would he have helped? He, I'm sure he did a thing or two, a, a quarter's worth of work, just to keep his uh, name going. <laughs> but it wasn't much. So if he helped with the stamping, it wasn't really useful. He also might have helped with the gas system. Even though the long stroke was not new, the gas tube, the gas block system, does resemble the AK-47s, if not the AK-46s. And I would also say magazines. Smizer was always kind of good at mags, the MP-28 and the MP-44. So the mag here and here, it could be said there's some similarities. Yes, both hold 30 rounds. Yes, both are curved. But there are differences. And there's also you know, prior magazines in Russia. So did he help there? Well, with that, it's time to look inside both of these and kind of compare to their influences and inspirations. Because we have both Kalashnikov and Schmeiser saying that Smizer didn't directly contribute or really help with the AK. We have their words. We've, we've compared historical notes and what Kalashnikov does credit. But let's get down to the physical, the mechanics. Does that agree with what both gentlemen are on record as of having said? Now, let's move away from history to physical appearance and the mechanics. And at first, the general silhouette does seem the same. They're both roughly 36 inches long. They both have a barrel just over 16 inches. And 
ironically, they weigh about the same. In fact, the Stungewehr weighs a little more, even though it's on a stamped receiver. It's got a very massive front trunnion. They have sights in a very similar pattern and style, including a front sight on a raised post, and they both have threaded muzzles. And again, the gas systems are pretty similar. Of course, they both have fixed stocks, although the Kalashnikov was offered from the get-go with an underfolding stock. And they both have pistol grips. Yeah, things of that nature are the same because they're both guns. They also both came from designers that really cut their teeth on submachine guns. Again, Schmeisser with the MP18, MP28, and Kalashnikov with his failed submachine gun prototypes. But the controls well, they start to get rather different. Sorry, I can't eject magazines because YouTube rules. The AK, of course, has a paddle mag release, and there's really no mag well as such. Mags rock up in there with very little going in. The Schungewehr, though, well, we have quite a mag well. It goes in there pretty deep. And instead of rocking in, it's a straight insertion. And we have a push button mag catch. So that's pretty different, even though they're both double stack, double feed, curved mags. On the other hand, both do have reciprocating charging handles, even though the Stungewehr's is on the left and the Kalashnikov's is on the right. That's okay though, I, I get that, I'll, I'll permit that. And even though they both have dust covers, well, they're very different designs. This one on the Stungewehr is separate and spring loaded, the one on the Kalashnikov, we already mentioned, is part of the safety, which is a single control. Whereas we come over here and we have a dual control system. Our selector is a cross bolt, and our safety is a stamped switch here. And it's on the trigger group versus on the side of the receiver. Again, that's, that's pretty different. And then when, how we disassemble them really starts to show even more. The AK, you know and love. Push button up here, move top cover. Sturmgewehr, you have a pin back here. Like a Kalashnikov, excuse me, like an HK or a Setme. Again, because of YouTube rules, don't want to disassemble them on camera, so be right back. So step one with the AK is of course, pull your top cover off and it's all contained here. And for the Stungewehr is pull out your pin. The only thing that retains it, aside from just good fit, is a spring here. And it is a loose pin. Theoretically, you could lose it because it's loose. And from there, you pull off your buttstock. Very unlike. And we have a very large recoil spring. This definitely belies its submachine gun heritage is it is nested inside this buttstock. This is why a folder could not exist, not unless you change that out. And not really a captive spring, at least not in the traditional sense. And again, let's compare that, of course, to our Kalashnikov spring. If I can do it here one-handed, there we go. It's now a captive unit on the 47. You know, it would be cool to have a 46 to compare with, but since Kalashnikov developed the 46 at Kovarov alone, or at least not at Ishesk with Schmeiser, it's really the 47 where we should see any influences if they exist. So here we are. And of course, the next step is to remove our bolt groups. Both do pull straight out. Come out as a unit. Of course, our strong cover comes straight out of the back. Easier said than done one handed. And you'll notice on this the bolt and carrier kind of self separate. We'll get to that, but I do want to look at the receivers and you know the differences here. Type 1 stamped or milled pretty much the same it's just instead of machine this is one millimeter stampings the double hook trigger was actually 
inspired by the Browning and Grand systems, but honestly was copied from the AB46 again, I believe, or maybe it was the uh, 44. You know, not much in there besides that. Very simplistic. And it's just a you know, rectangle. <laughs> That's the receiver. And same for the stamp. With the MP44, you have a hinge down trigger group. This is a very complicated trigger group, too. And it's riveted in place. Unlike, say, on a later Set Me or Heckler & Koch, where there's another push pin up here, this is more or less fixed. Now, it does fold quite a ways. And here we have that folding port door. And again, there's not much inside here. Now, it's pretty solid on the bottom, the way it's done, except for the cutouts for the... Stamped and welded steel, folded over, very rounded shape, but it too is, of course, very hollow. And we have a stamped steel handguard that's just friction fit. It's fit very well, but friction fit to the barrel. Whereas on a Kalashnikov, there's actually a retainer, and the gas, pis uh, the gas system cover is up there. This is a piece here. And then we have a very massive trunnion up here. Very, very different. Even though they're both originally stamped, the methodology, the shape, the stamping, the kind of lower piece, the recoil system where it's located, very, very different. What about the bolt group? Both have a long stroke piston. And it is essentially permanently attached to the carrier. So that is similar. Now the pistons are not the same. We have several gas rings here and all that. This is much simplified. But then we come back here and the carriers for one are very different. The hammer hits the back of the bolt here. The hammer actually comes up through this cutout here. It's a very different system. Now they both of course have the fixed handles. On the AK the bolt rotates and on the MP44 it's Stumgewehr it actually tips or tilts and is actually grabbed by these forks on the carrier itself right here so it kind of picks it up and then there's actually an extension back here that directly hits the edge of the firing pin on the bolt whereas on the AK it's contained in there of course you can easily pull it out but it's all one piece interestingly both have floating firing pins but the bolts very different and while the pistons are similar the carriers themselves function in a much different way. And if you can't tell, the bolt group and the fire control systems in these are very different. And the MP44, while it has a pretty simple receiver trunnion system like an AK, the individual parts and everything are just much more complicated because it's German and because, frankly, it came first. Reassembling this is a lot of fun. It's so unique. But, yeah, this is a lot easier, frankly. But I don't see a commonality in receiver styles at all. They don't disassemble even remotely the same. The shape, the way the receivers work. They use different types of bolt. Rotating versus tilting, tipping. Really, the only two areas that I smell potential Schmeiser influence are with the gas system and the magazines. However, what we're really looking at is did Schmeiser develop this and Kalashnikov took the credit or 
did Schmeiser sit, you know, behind Kalashnikov's shoulder and tell him what to do? No, because definitely Kalashnikov had some MP44s to study and was influenced by them. Also, the two designs were kind of growing from submachine gun to assault rifle, as it would soon be known. And so there's just a bit of a convergence there on what they're meant to do. The gun's shape, size, feel has a lot to do with the roles it's intended to play because human ergonomics, be they German or American or Russian, are the same, surprisingly. So I definitely think he had some MP44s to play with and borrowed some notions. But guess what? The Germans did that too. While the MP44 was intended to at least partially replace the MP40 and its submachine gun close quarters role, the Car 98, the Mauser's replacement, was still, even in 1944, meant to be the G43, or the K43, full power 8mm gun. But this was the second go, because the original attempt, the G41, had a flaw. It used the gas trap system, or bang system. Now, to be fair to Germany, the original M1 Grand used this too. This was a very popular system in the 1930s because it didn't require a hole to be drilled in the barrel for a gas port, and many at the time felt that a hole would negatively impact accuracy reliability. So the bang system would collect gas at the muzzle and divert it to an annular gas piston, which it hit a carrier. Unfortunately, the system, almost everywhere it was tried, immediately was found to be crap. In the meanwhile, gas piston systems, short stroke or long stroke, were found to be good. And while Germany did not have one in 1941 when they invaded Russia, Russia did. One of those great ironies of history is that the Germans seem to appreciate and enjoy the SVT-40, the Tokarev rifle, more than the Russians. To be fair though, Russia had been working towards a self-loading rifle since the early 1930s. It was a bit of a priority. Germany, on the other hand, really had not. In fact, it was really seeing the SVT-40 in action and also seeing the failure of the G-41 that prompted them to spur things on, including the MP-44 itself. So what do you do when your gun has a bad gas system, but your enemy's gun that you've captured thousands of has a good one? Well, you copy it, of course. And both gas pistons are quite easy to get to. The G43s, slightly more so. You have a single piece upper, upper hand guard versus a two piece on the SVT. Also a fun thing, you have to take out the cleaning rod to move the barrel band on this. But here's our gas piston long and it taps the carrier reciprocating handle in fact very similar to AK in a lot of ways and we have a tipping or tilting bolt here we have a somewhat more sophisticated version with an actual gas cylinder but it's still the same piston system although this has a non-reciprocating bolt handle and it actually uses a flapper style lockup for its bolt, not unlike a lot of things that Dittry have used in Russia, but again, it's kind of inspired from machine guns. So yeah, our G43, an SBT40. My only reason for pointing this out is, well, first, Russians can have some good ideas too, and Germany was happy to copy them. So if Russia copies Germany on a few things, it's only kind of natural. Secondly. All gun designers borrow good ideas from previous gun designers, or even contemporary, because if not, they would be reinventing the wheel every time they made a gun. Really, there's no such thing as a true, 100% clean sheet design. It doesn't exist. So, if the idea for a stamped receiver was carried over, but the execution was very different, and if the idea for the AK-47's gas cylinder system was taken from the MP44, although executed a little different. That's kind of par for the course. Maybe it's just paying Germany back for copying the SVT40, which of course the Simonov, the SKS, uses a similar system. 
that only leaves one more thing, the magazine. And if I'm being honest, this to me is maybe the area where you can say that Schmeiser had the most to do with. With the MP44, this kind of reinforced larger top area, that was something he patented in the 1930s. Magazines were kind of his thing. And you see that with these early so-called slab side mags, too. Even though they lock in very differently, locking lugs front and rear versus a more, frankly, AR-15 style mag couch. So I could see that, except we also have the SVT-40 up here. While this is only a 10 round mag in here, 20 rounds were tried out and it has a mag catch like an AK paddle style. We have a rear locking area and a front. We even have a gentle curve and we even have more of a slab side look. Double stack, double feed too. And we even have a very shallow magwell Kind of like a Kalashnikov. You can also point to the PPSH-41 magazine and the PPS-43 magazine. And there and again, Kalashnikov giving credit, he thought Sudiev's PPS-43 was the finest Russian firearm of World War II. Quite possibly the finest firearm in the world. So, frankly, I believe that Kalashnikov was mostly inspired by the PPS-43 mag, with some influence from the SVT-40. In fact, here's a 43 mag. I wasn't going to get one out, and then I realized there was one like one foot away from me. Has that same slab side look to it. Same double stack, double feed. Ridge in the back, just like on an AK. Curve. Designed for mass production. Uh, yeah, to me, these two mags have a lot in common, but they are smooth at top. It's like the SVTs. So if there is a Schmeiser influence with this mag, I would say the fact that the top is thicker and reinforced. Now, is this something he directly did? Or was just, or is this just an idea that Kalashnikov picked up from by looking at captured MP44s? I honestly don't know, and I'm not sure anyone could ever know for 100% sure. But looking at the mag, it seems to be mostly Russian DNA, but when it comes to the feed lip area, yeah, maybe just a little bit of Schmeiser smeared on top, a little bit of mustard on top there, just because it was a good idea. Russian. one of the slab sides from Atlantic. And with that, well, that's my refutation. What do you think? Yes, in the general shape of things, and to someone who hasn't disassembled and handled both, I can completely understand the connection. After all, the cartridges they fired were very, very similar, one being directly based on the other. And the roles they were meant to fulfill were very, very similar. When Germany pushed for the MP43 uh, and 44, STG 44, it was meant to be a kind of a big brother to a submachine gun. Again, a little unclear, but they figured it out. In Russia, the original program for 7.62x41, later 39, M43 cartridge, was to have four guns, a bolt action, a self-loading rifle, a light machine gun, and what we know today as a assault rifle, although I might argue it was still kind of classed as a submachine gun. The bolt action was dropped, the light machine gun became the RPD, the self-loading rifle became the SKS, leaving the Kalashnikov by design to fulfill the once upon a time submachine gun roll now select fire rifle roll combat roll it kind of explains the same size and length and all that 
and definitely coming up against MP44s on the Eastern Front for a year would directly inspire this. No, no question about it. But every gun we've looked at today, hell, every gun we've looked at on this channel over the last 12 years has been inspired by something. That's fair and should definitely be acknowledged in history. And I do think that Mikhail Kalashnikov rightly acknowledged his inspirations and help from his team at the Korov factory up to the folks he worked with at Ishask later on. I've also seen it claimed that he could not have developed the AK because he never met any guns before. This is patently not true. We've talked about two of his early designs. Yes, they were failures, but they existed. And he has many others. Now you might say, well, the PKM or the AK-74, well, they're just derivatives of this. Okay, how many designs did John Grand have? Let's see? When you hit gold, you hit gold. And you kind of go with what works. He had a successful system on his hands after a couple of failures. This is how design and invention works. And most firearms designers are lucky to have one or two successful designs. They can't all be Brownings. And to be fair, as many times as Brownie had a success, he had a lot more guns that never went into production or even really got past the patent stage. So that's not unusual. And the idea that, okay, he was just an ignorant tractor repairman what was Schmeiser? I mean, yeah, he was Germanic. He came from a firearms family. I completely agree with that. But he doesn't exactly have a hundred firearm designs to his name. No, he made his name with the MP18, MP28. Yes, he did make the MP41, although it was only a very limited success, and the MP44. So I would argue he has two, maybe three designs, plus some magazine systems that are as to his name. Again, very successful designer. I don't want to take that away from him. But no more or less than Mikhail Kalashnikov, I would say. Or frankly, anyone else. And as to him being German, great. They've certainly contributed to small arms. So has everyone else. The French in particular have done a lot. The US and Britain have done their part. And yes, Russia too has done its part. Each nation has had its own inventions and own creators and they've added to the body of knowledge that we have. Kalashnikov among them. Again, you might say that Kalashnikov and even Schmeiser lied. You can say that. Where's your evidence? If you're going to study history or anything, I agree going into it with some skepticism is a good idea, but you can't automatically assume everything is a lie. Some things you have to take on face value until and unless other evidence comes to the contrary. And that's why we looked at the mechanics. After going through the history and what they said in the timelines, we looked at the mechanics of the guns. This gun does not resemble this gun in the details. As I pointed out, the only couple of areas, maybe the long stroke piston being attached to the carrier, and the gas tube itself might be a little similar, and literally the feed lips, the top part of the magazine. Those are the areas where they're the same. And maybe there was influence from the MP44. And I say MP44 because I really do think the similarities there come from studying captured German guns, not direct input or influence from Schmeiser in 1948, 1949, 1950. The reason I say that, by the time the AK made it to Ishask, where he was at, it was mostly a completed design. Yeah, it was tweaked a little bit in 1948, but when you look at the prototypes of it, yeah, they're, they're pretty much fully fitted. And you can go back and look at previous Kalashnikov designs and see his mind. It didn't come out of nowhere. We see his design process. It's documented. 
And we have that with Schmeiser saying that he didn't influence it. Do I think that they maybe went to him to try to get the stamping down? Yes. But I think whatever advice he gave was not helpful. Because otherwise, why, why would we have seen the switch to milled receivers in 1951? See what I mean? They tried it. It didn't work. They went to milled. When you go to 1959 with that stamped receiver, it's a wholly different style and pattern. The AKM is very, very different from the original AK Type 1, 2, or 3. So, no, I don't see any direct influence. I think Kalashnikov came up with this because he was pretty creative. He was a soldier. He did first a lot of reading in 1942, and then he had real-world experience working at Proving Grounds in 1943. He had a couple of failed designs. He was uh, kind of studying under Stimanov and others, learned from the greats. And again, his country had the 1916, the Fedorov. Russia has had quite the history with self-loading infantry rifles. It in America kind of led the way. So is it any wonder that they would have the first truly mass-produced global assault rifle. No one's saying that the MP44 wasn't the first of its type. It was, for sure. But the AK was really what took it to the max. If this is the Model A vehicle, this is the Model T. <laughs> Similar, but different. But no, I don't see any evidence for Smizer. I've looked for years. I've seen what people say. Those that say it's evident, it's obvious. It's common sense. Why? How? Aside from the silhouettes being the same, frankly, if you want to see more direct connections to the MP44, I've said in other videos, the SEPMI, the G3, remind me a lot more of it. And there are more than a few elements from it that appear in the AR-10 and AR-15. The truth is, everyone copied a little something from this gun when designing their own assault and battle rifles in the 1950s and 60s and that's okay and for that matter many have gone on to copy and be inspired by Mikhail Kalashnikov's design as well so with that said I think he is rightly credited with its primary inventor or designer even if he was inspired and took some notes from previous guns so what so did John Grand and yes even John Moses Browning took inspiration and even maybe copied a few things from earlier designs. And with that, have I convinced you? What do you think of this updated video? Again, I wanted to be thorough, kind of looking at the questions and answers from the previous video, addressing those, a little more time and experience too. And I'm quite confident in my position. If you have any evidence, uh, not just, you know, feelings, uh, please post it below and we can have a very interesting discussion because I really do like discussing history. It's not emotional, it's just interesting to me, it's factual. And if nothing else, could you please like, share, and subscribe? And if you'd like to help support us, check out our Patreon or participate in one of our live streams. And before I lose my voice completely, this is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.